Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for braving the, the rain and the weather. Uh, this is the History is Lunch in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you've not already, please silence your cell phones. A few reminders, the excellent Stories Unfolded quilt exhibit, which is upstairs, will close on October 14th. If you've not seen that free exhibit yet, make a point of getting up there for that. And then the Manship House Museum will offer an evening of Victorian era board games tomorrow at 5 p.m. It's free for ages seven and up. Call or email to reserve your spot. It should be a lot of fun for everyone. We had our first in the, at this point, annual Austin Film Series in the Multi Garden last Friday. I saw some of y'all there. Um, we'll pick back up on Friday, October 5th at 6.30 p.m. with Bell. So put that on your calendars. And then I hope that you'll be able to join us here next week when our History's Lunch speakers will be Robin Lattimore and Mark Matrana to discuss their book, Southern Splendor, Saving Architectural Treasures of the Old South. Today, we are delighted to have Lucy Allen, Jim Ely, Jimbo Harwell, and David Morris discussing the architecture of this site. Uh, this site, learned this weekend, was named the Travel Attraction of the Year at the Governor's Conference on Tourism. Uh, not to brag too much, but well-deserved. I'll introduce our speakers in order, and then we will move forward with this packed program. Lucy Allen joined MDAH in 1978, working in the Old Capitol Museum of Mississippi History, as the state's history museum was known, as an assistant curator of exhibits. She went on to become director of education and programs, Old Capitol Museum director, and museum's division director. Earlier this year, Allen received the Dunbar Rowland Award from the Mississippi Historical Society for her lifelong contributions to the preservation, study, and interpretation of Mississippi history. And last month, Governor Phil Bryant presented Allen with the Excellence in State Government Award, which noted specifically her leadership over the last half decade of the complex process of designing and building these museums. Allen managed countless aspects of the project, including coordinating developments with architectural design professionals, exhibit designers, audiovisual producers, scholars, and donors. Lucy will be followed by Jim Ely and David Morris. Jim Ely is the founding principal in the Jackson office of Ely Guild Hardy Architects. He is a member of the AIA College of Fellows, past president of the Mississippi chapter of the AIA, and former member of the National AIA Board of Directors. He has served on the advisory councils of the Mississippi State University and Auburn Schools of Architecture. Appointed by two governors, Ely has served twice on the State Board of Architecture. David Morris is a senior project manager in the Jackson office of EGH Architects. He has served as key designer of projects throughout the state, some as joint venture associations with other architectural firms, including the Mississippi Supreme Court's Garton Building, the University of Southern Mississippi School of Business, and the University of Mississippi's Civil Rights Memorial and Kayat Law Center. From 1997 until the interior construction documents, Morris was ECD's principal designer for this two Mississippi Museums project. We'll also see a video of Phil Freelon discussing his role in the design of the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. Freelon is design director for Perkins and Will Architects in North Carolina. He led the design team for the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture and is the design architect for the National Center for Civil Rights in Atlanta. We'll wrap up with Jimbo Harwell. Jimbo is director of design for Godwin Group. His background includes freelance and agency graphic design and art direction for a wide variety of clients, including retail businesses, restaurants, schools and universities, real estate, museums, and the music industry. Harwell has worked on accounts including Trustmark, Mississippi Power, Mississippi Department of Education, and the Great American Steamboat Company. And you see a little bit of his work on the screen right now. Help me welcome Lucy Allen. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to start this story with talking about the Old Capitol Museum, which was the State History Museum from 1961 to 2005. But even before Katrina closed it, we had begun planning for a new facility in the 1990s. We just simply run out of room. 
we had put a moratorium on collecting and we had no room to expand the exhibits in the old Capitol. So in 1998, the Mississippi legislature passed a bond bill that would provide funds for a new archives building, which is a winter building, also planning construction documents for a new facility for us through, through the construction document phase. And also they had funded a new Supreme Court building that was supposed to be built by, beside the archives building. A little bit more on that later. ECD, a joint venture, was hired by the Department of Finance and Administration Bureau of Building. There were three firms in Jackson, Ely Gild, Hard, Hardy, Cook, Douglas, Farr, and Lemons, and Dale Partners that made up that ECD. And in 1998, we decided we would make our first attempt at the State History Museum. That was the first time I did, met David Morris. That was 20 years ago, and we are here today. The first attempt was to build the building behind the old Capitol. We were supposed to call it below grade because we weren't allowed to use the word underground. There was to be a tunnel to the War Memorial. Now think about this picture here and how, what, what kind of idea this was. We were to tunnel to the War Memorial and tunnel to the old archives building that would provide space for collections and staff offices that we would need. Thank goodness, now comes back the Supreme Court. They decided that they did not want to be located here looking down on the fairgrounds. They would prefer to be located across from the state capitol. So they relocated the spot that opened up this land, this state land for us and we asked for it at that time. So we began in earnest. In 2003, Cindy Gardner joined me as project manager. Cindy? And from that point on, we've been a team of two. In 2004, we'd finished the construction documents, and we talked about adding a civil rights wing on, but, but we were incorporating the civil rights story in the History Museum. But then with Katrina hit and, and an economic downturn, the project was all but halted. Now, in 2006, Governor Haley Barber had formed a civil rights commission that would talk about planning a private civil rights museum. And they had determined through their studies that it would be at Tougaloo College. Simultaneously in 2006, the Mississippi legislature formed a feasibility study that would see about funding a state civil rights museum. But with the economic times such as they were, funds were not forthcoming for either one. In December 2010, former Supreme Court Justice Reuben Anderson, who was a member of our board, and Governor William Winter, who was a longtime board president, met with Governor Barber. What followed was that Governor Barber, in his 2011 State of the State Address, announced that the state would fund the Museum of Mississippi History and the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum to be built side by side under one facility. When the legislature mandated in 2011 that we open in the bicentennial year of December the 10th, 2017, it seemed like we had plenty of time. Um, it, the time seemed to go faster and faster as we moved along. One of the things is the bond bill provided the funding for the building, and all totaled, the state has provided $90 million. They would provide 50% of the funds for the exhibits. The other 50% we had to raise through private funding. We needed at least $11.5 million, and we raised $20 million in private funds. Our original justification years earlier when we were thinking about building a new history museum, our justification had been, well, first of all, we had no collection storage space. We put a moratorium on collecting all of Mississippi's history. We were an institutional, um, educational institution, especially K through 12, and when Katrina hit, we were closed to all of those school groups, and they were not getting the education in Mississippi history. Well, that approach was not working during dire times, dire, dire economic times, so I changed from education to the other E, economics. We came up with some economic impact figures. $17 million would be generated from the annual visitation. We would have 500 construction-related jobs that would generate $19 million in wages. 
and we would put $2 million in the general fund contribution from this construction project. Now that perked everybody's ears up when they heard about this economic impact that we would have. We began the process, the design process in 2011, and not that I would need to remind you, but this is not a typical office building design. It is a very, very complicated uh, building that required a lot of weird things that we ask of the architects. We needed load bearing requirements because we had some artifacts that weighed from one to three tons, and we wanted to make sure that the floors would support them. We needed a really large freight elevator. We've got exhibits, workshop, conservation lab, paint booths, those types of things that aren't a typical building, and they need special ventilation and safety requirements. We asked them for a walk-in freezer so that we could put artifacts in there when they come in and they might be contaminated from the field. We needed to isolate them. We've got very strict um, climate controls, the temperature and the humidity, security controls, all those types of things. And then we talked about products that you would use in the construction of the building that were inert, that would not off-gassing cause harm to our 20,000 artifacts. Plus, there were multiple design projects going on. There's the design of the building, but then we're going to design two museums. And then we're also going to design and fabricate and install a whole series of signage that will recognize our donors. So there was a lot going on during this process. In fact, the demand was so great on ECD that I don't know how they did it. Then we go to them a second time and ask to hire them under a separate contract just to help us manage the exhibits and all the special needs that would be required within the exhibit spaces. We had raised flooring and very complicated lighting system, just to name a few of the things that were going on in those spaces. Then we asked for a suspended balcony, and then we asked for a 40-foot sculpture space in another museum, so we, we just had all kinds of surprises for them. But they came through with flying colors. They never, never stopped. I want to acknowledge that they are the best group of architects that I will ever hope to work for. I know that Cindy will agree. <laughs> I know that she will agree that they were the best listeners, and no matter what came up, they figured out a way to do it, and we really appreciate that. They always did it with a smile on their faces, and um, they always showed respect, which is also very important. The night of the grand opening, I made a statement that we had joined together, and we prepared the work as partners, and we tackled all the pro uh, problems as a team. But I think the most meaningful thing that I said is that we finished this facility as a family. I want to thank Jim and David, and also Chris Myers and Russ Blunt. Those are my family at ECD. And thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to now show a short video. We're going to see four years of construction in two minutes and 43 seconds.
これもLucy asked that we would come, David and I would come to talk about the design of the building. So architects, a, a look in a way that there's been a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of money really spent before we ever come on to the team. So we feel like we've been on it a pretty long time, but, but I know the time goes uh, longer than our, our time. So uh, Lucy has, I almost want to say, well, Lucy's, Whatever she said, we agree with and sit down, but she, I, I, I want to talk about, I'm going to go over the design team because it was a big team. It involved a lot of people from different parts of the state and, different, and then three firms here. As Lucy said, this, some of this will be repetitious, but I think it's important. <clears throat> uh, ECD was architect of record. Um, the Freeline Group was brought in uh, to design the Civil Rights Building. Uh, the two exhibit designers, of course, the building essentially, the most important thing it does apart from projecting image is it, it, it encloses the exhibitions. And uh, the, b both companies, Gerald Hilferty and Design Minds, did an excellent job. They were, it, and I hope you agree with that. <clears throat> so, so what was my role in, in the in this design team. I was selected to be the principal in charge of design. That was, that was my role. I took that role very uh, seriously. Um, this is a very important building. Uh, all buildings are, but this was a very important building. And, and, and my job, as I saw it, was to make sure that, design, that the design was appropriate, uh, that it meets the owner's needs, that it's within the budget, that it will last a long time, that it's sustainable and built well. Uh, and I took that as a serious charge. Uh, this building, I think, is one that it reflects the value that we place on our history. And to me, that is a very important thing. David Morris with our firm <clears throat> was responsible for the design uh, starting all the way back in, in 1997. Uh, and 20 years is a pretty long time for an architect to be uh, committed to a single project. Not that we didn't do other work in between, or we wouldn't be here, but, uh, and, and David, uh, he, he stayed with it, as, as Lucy says. And, and of course, Phil Freeline and Chris Grillis with the, uh, the Freeline group were responsible, largely for the exterior of the Civil Rights Building. Many others made major contributions. Uh, Katie Lightsey and Keith Myers with, with CDFL, Jeff Barnes and Russ Blunt with Dale Partnership. Plus, we had mechanical engineers and electrical engineers and cost engineers and acoustical engineers, all part of the team that made a, a, an important contribution to it. <clears throat> and the staff and board of archives and history uh, we have a saying in our office that we've said, I've said it many, many, many times in my practice, that a project can only be as good as the client is good. And, and that is an informed client, a client with clear goals, a client who has confidence in their architect, and a never tiring desire to make the building special. That is what we call a good client and we believe that a good client is required to have a good billing, however good or bad the architect is. We had such a client in Lucy, Cindy Gardner, Kane Ditto, Hank Holmes, Katie Blunt, Governor Winter, Governor Barber, and other members of the staff. So we had what we needed to do a good job. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to talk a little about uh, the philosophy of our firm uh, on design. Uh, I'm going to talk about the History Museum first, then we'll talk about the Civil Rights Museum. Uh, we have always thought that the design at hand, whatever we were working on, should reflect the importance of the building. And we don't think all buildings have the same importance. A place of worship is clearly more important than a food mart. 
Uh, and it's also, we believe, have also believed that public buildings are more important than private buildings. And we have always felt that because public buildings are, represent a shared goal of the community, in this case the state. Uh, and, and we think that is because uh, it's, it's that shared goal and it's a shared ownership. In a public building, we all are part owners of it. So we think those are, are more important than commercial or retail building. Uh, we think this building, uh, the History Museum, is important because it reflects our value, uh, what we place on our history. And it, it, in, in some way, it says, and we think all buildings as well, it says it, it reflects what we think of ourselves. Uh, and so additionally, in a, in a, in the, to the fact that some buildings are more important than others, some sites are more important than the others. And this is an important site, uh, a site that is the focal point of a major corridor like the old Capitol and, the, and Capitol Street. That puts, uh, that's an important site and puts more pressure on the building that goes there. And the site of this museum is on the northern edge of what is known as the, as the Capitol Green, uh, which was, went all the way back to 820. 1822 it was selected uh, for the location of the capital, the location of a court, and the location of a college. So it's a very important site. And on this site, the Capitol Green, sits the old capital, the war memorial, of the capers, uh, and the, the, I, I say the new William Winter building, it's not as new as it once was. But, but <clears throat> so that's a group of buildings. And, and one of our beliefs is that we, we should design a building that fits within those buildings. They, 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 they're a part of that group of buildings. That uh, it takes its cues of, from design from those buildings in terms of material, in terms of massing, in terms of proportion. Uh, we strongly feel that the buildings, whatever building we do, should relate to the context in which it is placed. Uh, we feel that the new building uh, should be timeless. Uh, we think it should not be trendy. It should not be uh, stylish, but it should be contextual. It should not shout for attention. That's a core belief within our firm for all buildings. And in, in this case, most importantly in this case. <clears throat> now, I'm going to ask David Morris, the principal designer for the museum, to come up and walk us through the actual design of the building. Uh, and as, as Lucy said, uh, David, is a, he's a senior designer in our firm. Uh, he and I have worked hand in hand for 20 years on this. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to say that David was not alone in, in the process of the design of this building. So I'm going to turn it over to David now. Uh, I, I just want to say about Lucy, always supported, supportive, always with confidence in us and always convinced that this project somehow would be funded and be a reality. I wasn't always with you on all those points in that 20 years, so, but you never yielded from that. So I'm going to let David walk us through now. sketches of the museum, but um, some presentation imagery that occurred at different phases of the design. All right, this is a site plan of the old Capitol, and Jefferson Street is down sheet, and State Street is up sheet. So uh, you can see here the footprint of the old Capitol, the first floor plan, the Capers Building, and the War Memorial. And although we don't call it an underground building, it was an under almost completely underground building. We expanded the back, eliminating those terrace parking lots, and had a green roof and ex extended the Capitol Green. This was a design, became a design development document that was completed in 1999. It's about a 73,000 square foot uh, facility, 
and it's smaller than the current one because we were able to use, as Lucy recommended, a, through a tunnel, the collection storage and curator spaces, shop spaces, in, to be in the, the current garden, uh, uh, the current, current Carol uh, Capers building, sorry. And this was the tunnel that would access that. So here we have here a big two-story volume for the exhibit space itself. You come in through a bridge on a drive that was on the old railroad bed. You've got a lobby with a rotunda that goes up to the green roof. And in blue are all the education and uh, administrative spaces for the museums. We've got a big temporary gallery here. Um, so this is, this is basically, we got to a fairly good level of resolution on a scheme that we were a little bit terrified about. Here you can see why. You've got the old Capitol here, which was, according to our way of thinking, the main artifact for this, this design of the museum. And then you'd have our building be, be digging the same kind of hole you just saw in the video right behind the old Capitol. Two-story volume for collections. Let the exhibitors design what they needed inside that space. Here's a rotunda that goes up to the, um, the lawn level, and you can see the side of the War Memorial. Um, so we were very glad when the site moved. This, this is an elevation drawing as if you were on the drive, looking back at the old Capitol. You can see it was a long, low building that defers to the prominence of the old Capitol. Um, it is out of limestone, which is the material for the capers and the war memorial and the base of the old Capitol. At the time before the old Capitol was renovated, all the sides were brick from an earlier renovation. During the course of this work, um, the other sides became restored to their plastered so this side has remained brick. It's the only side left that is brick. So while we were designing, uh, the, while we were actually building the, uh, finishing the construction documents for the William Winter building here, and we flipped the orientation around, just to let you know, this is, Jefferson Street is here now. So um, while we were doing the design of this, uh, for construction, we were doing the design development for the museum here. And as Lucy mentioned, this site became available for the History Museum, which we, we very much prefer. Um, so in 2002, we started working on this site. We added about 50,000 square feet because we were taking with us the spaces that were to be in Capers, the collection storage, the exhibit shop, this, the wood shop, those sorts of spaces, curatorial offices. And uh, that meant we had a four-story building. So we were trying to mass figure out how to analyze the site. Once again, we've rotated the site plan, trying to keep you disoriented, but. <laughs> Jefferson Street is right down here. This is the William Winter Building. This is the central mechanical plant. And so we decided by looking at the massing of the building, the program, and the site itself, that the end, the north end, was the better location to put the history, State History Museum. And we, we preserved and reserved this space as a green space it's kind of on a slope. We called it the bowl. It's sort of remnant of the bluff. And then this is a two-tier two parking garage. So that was kind of our first conceptual idea once we had analyzed and digested the program on this new site, starting over um, with the information we had done underground. Um, this is one of the early massing model studies where we had dealt with that hundred, an extra 50,000 oh, 50, square feet and starting to figure out the height that should be, we've, we've felt it should be, like Mr. Ely had mentioned, part of its context. So the cornice is the same height as the William Winter cornice, which is also the War Memorial height. Um, then we looked at the articulation of the structural bays and how that might, that large of a building mass and elevation might be broken down. This is an earlier study. It's a little more modernist um, design approach. Um, but we, you can also see we had already started to come to the idea that we would have an exhibitory box and a, an education and uh, lobby box, and then we would have a slice of space between, called a, we called it a slot, that would be our common public space, and that's the two-story garage. Here are some elevations from right before the DD set, a presentation early, early on of that scheme of the History Museum before the Civil Rights became a part of the project. So here you're looking at um, the elevation that would be facing the uh, uh, William Winter Building, so that's the porch. It's very similar to the porch we have now. Here's that slot we'd be looking at. That's our entry. This is the brick on the exhibit box, another porch facing North Street. And we picked the limestone because it's a part of what the rest of the complex is. It relates to those uh, buildings, and it's a part of the public frontage. The rest of the building is brick. 
So we have a brick mass on the north, and we have an articulated limestone facade there because we thought the approach from High Street would become a prominent one, one of the main interstate approaches to the facility. This is the slot on the fairground side. This is the brick mass of the exhibit gallery collections here, loading dock. We had a courtyard and a little bridge connecting the exhibit and um, education wing. And here's just a sort of a start of an idea of a multi-level parking garage, which became the site for the civil rights. And this is a section through that slot, looking back towards William Winter, towards the south. So you can see here the bridge and the courtyard overlooking the loading dock, and then the collection storage and mechanical below. This is the courtyard, the lobby, and its monumental stair that leads up to a bridge that connects over to the exhibits. The exhibits in this design were two levels, two story and two levels, and it started on the upper level instead of the main level like it does here. This is a model, an early version of Revit model rendering of the interior lobby. You can see the brick mass becomes a sort of a monumental screen wall that filters you from the public lobby into the exhibit spaces. You just come in the entry off of North Street, a little information desk, and you're looking back at the bridge that leads to the galleries and the enclosure out to the courtyard overlooking the fairgrounds. Another view of a, a slightly earlier version of the same model where you're looking back from the bridge across the lobby and the monumental stair to the bowl and William Winter modeled in the background and eventually the old Capitol Dome. And this is the rendering we completed at the end of the phase of um, the museum by itself. This was the summer of 2007. And as Lucy had mentioned, Katrina and the recession uh, impacted the progress from then on. But we did annually update the cost estimate until about 2010. So Lucy did have faith it would get, get uh, funded. We did an estimate update every year throughout the recession, and all was quite challenging. Thank you. Okay, um, in the summer of 2011, after we had completed the design for the History Museum and done the, all the construction technical drawings and uh, had the bid documents ready to go, but did not have funding for it, um, I got a call from Governor Barber to ask if the Civil Rights Museum could become a part of the History Museum and would it fit on the site with the History Museum and what would it cost? <clears throat> and he mentioned at the end of that conversation he needed an answer soon. And so we did a rather quick concept, conceptual design to determine that. And we determined that the answer to the first two questions was yes. Yes, it could be a part of the History Museum. Yes, it could fit on the site and it would cost $88 million. I, I let Lucy say where we wound up. I don't know, but that's what we said at that point. Um, <clears throat> so we did, um, we decided, let me back up, we decided to uh, place the civil rights. This had been planned, as David says, as a parking, this is the History Museum, William Winter. We had reserved this for a parking deck all along, whether it was initially to be built or later to be built, and always wanting to hold this green in front to create a, a, a foreground for these buildings. So the decision was made, uh, the, that concept, we thought we'll put the civil rights building on top of the parking garage. Uh, and this was a kind of a first study of that, uh, with history being over here, civil rights being over here. And then there were two entries at the time. Whether to have one or two entries was a very uh, serious discussion that it kind of went back and forth. Um, and at a times an emotional discussion, I will say. But so th this one would have put it here. We would have had parking below this whole area, a, a lower courtyard here. And then we also did, I realize we, this, you can't read this, but I, I've got it oriented the same way. To, and, and in this case, it would be one common entry. Uh, and the advantage of the common entry, just it created a great efficiency in design because then you could have support spaces here between them 
the lobby, the toilets, the, the, the gift shop, and the room we're in now that could be shared. And so there was an efficiency in that. And so this was a kind of a first pass we made of, of a civil rights design right here. Uh, we, we, we kept the bowl in this design. Uh, we then we did, a, did, did another more modern design. But all of those sketches there simply indicated the building as programmed could fit on the site. Uh, and then once that was decided, we were asked to do a more definitive uh, study of which th this was done uh, <clears throat> to be used uh, for legislature approval and legislature funding. Uh, and so we, we did that. Here's a little more advanced of that. This was history. This was civil rights. This is William Winter. This was a, a court in front of it. Here we were thinking of a, of a more modern building here with glass across it like this. Um, and then at this point, we had two entries, uh, which was after more study, we wound up with two, with two entries. Um, now, there was a lot of working with the, with the advisory commission Lots of presentations, lots of discussion about what to do on this point and other points. But as David had mentioned, the funding, the approval of this uh, stipulated that we would employ a nationally known civil uh, architect with experience in civil rights, design of civil rights museums. Uh, and, and, and there is entered Phil Freelon. Uh, who, 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 who met those qualifications, and I think Lucy mentioned uh, that his firm was involved in the design of the, of the uh, National Museum of, um, of African American History and Culture in, in Washington, D.C., which is probably the more, most significant uh, type museum of that, of that nature in our country. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm just going to kind of wrap up by saying this. Not all architects share the same philosophy in what should guide their design. And, and Phil Freeline was one of those. Uh, Phil seemed to take more, uh, be more guided by uh, uh, metaphorical connections than fitting in within the context of the buildings that, of which his design was. Uh, and, and, and they placed these red lines on these photographs of the civil rights era. Uh, and you can see that they eventually wound up literally on the building. Uh, and Phil thought that was a very important thing. Uh, he thought the building should uh, express the tension and passion of the time, more importantly than fitting in with what we might have done, m more contextual, more related to the buildings uh, uh, around it. Uh, now, I was skeptical of that, <clears throat> and um, Elbert's not here today, but I knew one day I would have to face him on the street, and, and he would say, Jim, what, you know, what's that? But, but I would have to honestly say I was skeptical, and Lucy saw that this was appropriate well before I did, uh, and, and, and I feel, and I feel today very strongly uh, that, that it's a good design. Uh, I'm going to go one more. I feel that... Uh, that, the his, that this history museum, which is we always viewed as a bookend to this group of buildings with, with history being on one end, capers being on the other end, and we saw the crown jewel being the old state capitol. And, and we felt this was strong enough to, to hold, the, hold that context, even, even with this more modern building that expressed a, a whole different thing. So we, we, I, I was slow to come up on this. Uh, Lucy led me through to that, but I, I think it was the right thing to do. Uh, and I, I, this is a plan of the buildings, um, and this is the civil rights thing. And the, this little light of mine, you can see how it, it, it uh, I'm going to back up, how it created, it was built to be the major space in the museum. Uh, these lights and this, this was a visual uh, projection of the importance of that. 
and the fact that you can see into that was it really drove that plus these uh, diagonal lines is really what drove that that elevation uh, and and here you can see uh, in yellow civil rights in green white and you can see all the rest of that is support and the fact that these two museums became one building that did not have to be replicated for each if, if, if either one had been on another site you would have had a replication of, of that uh, of course that's what drove the uh, the exterior there Here's the night shot. I tried to do better than that, but it's, I came the other night and took this, and my camera didn't, didn't, doesn't portray the vivid color that you actually see. But to me, it just struck me that that is kind of a beacon of light and kind of a beacon of hope. It, 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 I hope some people feel that way. Um, I put this slide in to kind of show, uh, to try to illustrate the strength of the juxtaposition of those two different designs. One more classical, one more contemporary. Um, I think this shows it in my eye uh, well. And just walk through, I'm sure you've been through the museum, but uh, the, the history museum. Uh, here's some of this common area, the uh, lobby. Um, Hall of History, and then um, I would just close by saying how thankful our firm is to have been a part of this, uh, the, the design of this, and that we feel like it's a successful project, and feel like that the exterior design is equal to the importance of the content and the history it describes. So that that would end my presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, as we know, this is two museums together, and there's the History Museum and there's the Civil Rights Museum, and the relationship is, is a close one, and it's an important one, because civil rights in Mississippi is part of the history of the entire state. And so um, they're joined together, they share space, and at the same time, there's a contrast that we've set up here where uh, the new part of the building um, has a, a more dynamic feel to it, and the historic part uh, has more of a traditional architectural flavor, right? And so uh, bringing those two together create a dynamic, and so we're entering right at that junction where the, where the two come together. Um, that's where we enter, okay? And so that shared space, that shared lobby is something that both can, can uh, work with. And, and there are other important spaces like the gift shop and the theater and the gathering spaces. So, and so what we tried to do here is, uh, is take uh, the building and try and express some of that story. Of course, the civil rights story in Mississippi uh, is triumphant in some ways, but it's also difficult. It's also, um, you know, the, the, the very uh, dark side of things. And, and what we're trying to do here is create a little bit of tension in the architecture, the angles are, are suggesting in a way some of that strife uh, that, that was part of you know, coming through that part of our, our history. And then natural light is really important. While we're trying to control that, uh, because you don't want a lot of light coming into the exhibits, but at the same time you want the, the, um, the natural light and all that that brings, uh, we know that, that sunlight and daylight is a good thing. It's nurturing, there's a spirituality to it. So we want that part, but then at the same time, we want to control that a bit so that the exhibits aren't overwhelmed with, with uh, direct sunlight. So there's a, a delicate balance there. And even with the, at night, you know, and the light's coming out through into the plaza, and all that we're standing on now is going to be a beautiful landscape plaza, you know, working with the building, you know, uh, integrating the exterior and the interior is a big part of what we tried to do. What about the light? Yeah. And so the, I mentioned the angles, uh, and, and in some ways it's, it's describing uh, a little bit of the conflict and strife, but also it's uplifting. We see that that angle is pointing to the sky, and you know, p different people will see different things in the building, and I think that's good. We don't want to be literal or try and be overt about a message. We want to be subtle, and so I love it when 
people come and, and interpret that for themselves. What does this mean to them? And understand Miss Everest came and, and she said that this angle was pointing upward to heaven, to her son. And so that really touched my heart. It wasn't really um, intended that way, but to be interpreted that way is, is really perfect. Hello? I did. Can you hear me now? Okay, thanks. I wanted to go ahead and say thank you to Mississippi Department of Archives and History uh, for in inviting me uh, to speak about the uh, logo design for the two Mississippi museums. Um, I would also like to go ahead and say thanks to Katie Blunt and Stephanie Morrissey um, and of course, Chris, um, and uh, they are the ones that we work with closely, closely on this part of the project. Um, we're very excited and very uh, proud um, to be part of that. I brought some snapshots today, and I will briefly take you through the process of the thinking and the arrival at a solution for the uh, logo designed for the two Mississippi museums. Thank you. When we engaged, this is, um, probably around the phase of the construction. Um, and uh, to begin our process, we um, uh, were able to, and I meant to mention, of course, Lucy as well, um, because she and Stephanie took us on some of our initial tours um, to gather as much uh, knowledge as we could about um, what design was in place already before we continued with anything that, that we would uh, recommend. I'll say something uh, briefly too about um, logos um, and, and the language and how we uh, talk about logos. Um, they're not just decoration and this sort of uh, echoes something that Jim said about um, having a sense of uh, uh, respect uh, and empathy and um, listening to the needs um, um, of, of the program and, and, and again part of that is um, to sort of embrace the idea that a logo is less important than the product it signifies. What it means is more important than what it looks like. So in a way, <clears throat> a logo is kind of like, a, like architecture. Um, it's a container, um, or uh, especially a new one, an empty vessel, uh, which is um, designed to accept meaning um, as it's poured in over time. Um, and that was something that we considered very strongly. So um, what was our assignment is to design an identity system that reflects brand, the brand of the Museum of Mississippi History and the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum that can be unified as the two Mississippi museums while all remaining distinct with strength to stand alone. What I'll do now is kind of let, 
let you kind of um, peek into the behind the scenes of, of what we did, which was, again, um, learn about what design was in place. We had um, uh, the benefit of, of having uh, uh, full freedom to explore however we wished. Um, however, I thought it was important to create some constraints for ourselves as well. Um, we wanted there to be consistency with um, elements that were already in place and approved and um, uh, in, in construction and underway as well. Um, so I'll start with some fun stuff here. We had to start making decisions. So we started by looking at colors, surfaces, and materials. We wanted to become familiar in a very intimate way. Lucy um, took me to the depot and we um, look, looked at uh, many materials. Um, we took these color palettes to the office and uh, uh, poured over them with a lot of fun. Here are some more materials. Again, just snapshots of the process. We also had um, an understanding and, and, or discovery that there was a typographic system in place that we wanted to consider. We wanted that to be consistent with um, what the architectural signage um, uh, and how that was going to play into the construction and design as well as the exhibition designs, wayfinding um, in the building and so on. We wanted that to be consistent with the word mark portion design um, of the logos. Um, also in this drawing, you can see on the left side were um, some initial executions. There, there was a moment of exploration uh, where we went a couple of rounds before we um, arrived at a solution. Um, and I believe that was essential in, in arriving at a, at a point of discovery where we felt like we had an answer that would work. Um, so a couple of things that we considered that were ex extremely exciting to think about were, um, uh, I was fascinated that there was one entrance to, to the two museums. Um, and that definitely played into the conceptual process. Um, how could I use that as a, uh, a visual feature in the identification um, of the two museums? Um, also, you can kind of see, um, we started looking at type specimens and how we were going to use them in a standardized way. Um, and I also, um, um, was challenged with how to deal with this mathematical numeral, numeral two. Um, and that was something that um, I really had to wrestle with a bit as a designer um, for that um, to make sense in our future plans. So with that being said, I would have to say that um, after visiting uh, the museum several times during construction that um, I thought it was important uh, after uh, several concepts that didn't really hit the spot and they didn't really communicate what we needed to communicate uh, and did not identify uh, the museums properly. Um, I have to say that I would uh, inspired by the architecture um, and I felt like the marks or the logos needed to uh, uh, signify a sense of place. Um, so a lot of the rationales that we ended up finding were in the um, same rationales of the architecture. So after going back to the office one afternoon, I, I whipped out some tissues and, and started sketching 
what I could remember without looking at the building um, for memorization. Um, how could I create um, a symbol or an icon that was somewhat hieroglyphic, something that anyone could draw or remember? Um, I wanted something contemporary and something that was um, timeless, um, but it also had to have meaning. And, and again, our brief was a challenge because we were designing for, uh, at first we thought one logo, which turned into three. Um, again, that system had to work together. Well, the first image that burned into my mind was this. Um, I would have to say that, again, light played a big uh, part in um, the inspiration of the design. Um, it's what made these shapes present in my mind, especially when I uh, made the sketches. So that you can see now, t as I advance here, um, that is echoing the shape. It's sort of a, uh, I don't know if I would call it a reduction, but a sort of an abstracted or simplification of a form that uh, exists in physical space. And here's the rationale behind this form. This mark tells the story of a place that has amassed a collection of treasures to share. Traditional lines echo the columns that define the museum's exterior architecture as it appears in the presence of light. At the same time, it subtly evokes the idea of a row of books, so to speak, and capital letter M for Mississippi and museum. Here it is with its typography, Missis Museum of Mississippi History. Then I thought about, um, I thought about Phil Freeline a lot. Um, I was fortunate enough to watch the video um, early on, and it was very exciting because he said many things that resonated with me. So. A couple of things that he mentioned was you don't have to be literal or overt. And I thought that was a very profound statement and certainly helped with logo design. Um, also, inspiration uh, for this mark was that natural light and its ability to evoke spirituality. Um, that rang true with me and led me to take this form into this shape. And again, let me remind you that these colors came directly or were inspired directly from palettes that were already in place by the exhibition designers. This mark tells a complex story, like the museum it represents <clears throat> is meant to encourage conversation and contemplation. While angles evoke signs of tension and struggle, bright rays of light illuminate progress. This mark echoes the exterior architecture and loosely follows the lines of the capital M, yet it remains more abstract and open to interpretation. Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. Now, that thing about the um, one entrance, um, because I gave both of these marks um, the same amount of real estate to live on, uh, so to speak, um, I was able to join them. So um, I got my entrance back. These are balanced. 
they're distinct, but they also have a sense of equality and presence, and visual presence, and philosophical presence. Just like the places they represent, these marks speak to, speak to and face one another. Working together, they express their relationships as well as their differences. In this design, the marks of each museum join together in a single shared space, just like the facility itself. Where these shapes come together, they create a sense of perspective. And when the eye sees a vanishing point, it inherently understands that the story continues, just like our Mississippi history. Thank you. Microphone. Microphone. It's on. It's on. Book run. All right. It's no surprise that a project <clears throat> decades in the making with so many talented people could not be told in an hour straight. And so we have run up past the time for question and answer. I know that there are lots of questions here. I am morally certain that all of our speakers today will be happy to answer those questions at that table right over there. We have a book on the story of the museums that is uh, on sale at a 20% discount today if you're interested in that. It's over at the table here. Thank you all for coming today. I hope we see you next week. Thank you especially for braving the rain. Help me thank Lucy Allen, Jimbo Harwell, Jim Ely, and David Morris for this terrific program today.